Well, I was I was also going to say, you know, you like to encourage new writers, and bless you, you know, I'm almost 73, and I still consider myself a fairly new writer because, although I've been writing all my life, it's it's I've I've the only things I've really made money on were ghostwriting for other people or corporations, and you know that's an entirely different thing, writing your own fiction. Uh, and and I, I now have some leisure, it's not leisure time, but I have some time that I can choose to use differently now. And uh, all these years I've been experimenting, I can't tell you how many novels I have in the drawer. You know, like, oh, no, not that one. But the ones that I'm most proud of um, are the ones on my website right now. The Tango novel was really me stepping into, well, now I'm going to write fiction. And then I'm really not sure how I started writing young adult fiction. I just, it was, the, the protagonist, uh, Stevie, just stepped into my mental movie and said, excuse me, I have a story. Hey everyone, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. I have a great guest with me today. And if you're seeing this uh, on video by any means or anything, you'll see a beautiful backdrop of all kinds of great memories and photos and paintings and my guest today is uh, very talented, not only with a pen, writing a book, but also with art. So welcome to my podcast today, Christine, and nice to have you here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Nice to have you here. So one thing I want to do a little different today is I want to start usually where we end. I'd like to start with your website, and I'd love for you to tell people who are listening, if I go to your website, what am I going to see? Where do I start? Let's talk about your site right off the beginning. Is that okay? Okay, perfect. Yes. Um, my uh, website is at christinabach.com. And that is Christina with a K, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-A-B-A-K, Bach, my last name, dot com. And on that website, you will first be directed to um, <laughs> pictures of me. Oh, goody. But... <laughs> <laughs> You will meet that way. Um, and uh, an opportunity to sign up for my newsletter. And I don't send those out so often that they're oppressive, but once in a while I do. And when you sign up for that newsletter, then you will um, automatically be uh, offered a free copy of my first young adult novel now ever, because today we're going to be talking about my nov uh, young adult novel series. Yes. Uh, the first copy, uh, the first book now ever you can get as an e-copy by signing up for the newsletter. Or, of course, you can buy it, which is great <laughs> if you go to a bookstore or something. Um, and, and then you will see information about, um, about uh, the second book, which is called Mirage, which is the one that is currently new. And... Uh, uh, that continues Stevie's story. You'll also see some information about one of my adult books, which is uh, based on my love for tango. It's a, a tango novel. And uh, if you like tango, that's a great, great place to go. Uh, the other things you will find on my website, of course, history, eh, my background, everything. And also my blogs going back forever. I think there's like five or six years of blogs out there from my different wow. lives that I've led over the time <laughs> and some very pretty pictures involved in them, uh, pictures of the outdoors here in Oregon, which is absolutely beautiful. So again, if you go to christinabach.com, hey, you can sign up or not. That's up to you. And uh, hopefully you'll have a nice journey through the variety of things there. Good. Well, after our discussion today, I'm hoping that we have many new visitors come to your site. And the one thing I like on your site, you mentioned that your your novels are for readers from age 12 to 112. So that's a pretty big okay. group of people. I, I've actually upped that to 120 because um, I found a wonderful uh, quote by a French woman named Louise Chaumont, or Calmont, I believe. She was interviewed at 120. And she said, um, being young is a state of mind. It doesn't depend on one's body. I'm actually still a young girl. It's just that I haven't looked so good the last 70 years. 
<laughs> and I, I love her spirit, and yeah. I think it's a wonderful attitude. And what I find very valuable in both writing and reading young adult fiction is that within each of us, there's still that young person, that young maybe teenager who didn't get the information or the attention or the love or the reassurance that they needed at that age from the things they were reading. And you can still go back and retrieve that at any age. Uh, it, it can be very healing both to read, but also to write. And um, I part of what um, I mentioned to you before is this phenomenal, weird healing experience I had in writing uh, Cold Mirage when I was struggling, as so many of my fellow authors do, with well, I know how my character feels, but how am I going to get that out in words? And, and really, she doesn't seem to be feeling enough, given what she's going through. How do I do that? And then I thought, but that makes perfect sense to me, because I'm very good at, you know, walking up traumatic memories. Ah, oh, that didn't happen. No problem. Yeah. I handled it. Uh, and so I'm expecting something of my protagonist that I don't do myself. And so I had this weird, weird experience of my character Stevie's hand, and, and one of her gift in the story is that uh, she can heal all pain with her touch. I had this experience of hand actually reaching out through my, God help us, through my laptop, and putting her hand on my, on my heart and saying, well, you try it. In other words, okay, you want me to feel all this stuff? Maybe if you try it, you know, it might be an idea. You could maybe write about it. And honestly, I found that so healing. It was like I, I put both hands on my heart, and I felt like, oh, I was just being flooded with new feelings and information um, that uh, I had not experienced before. And so it's really stuck with me as a wonderful experience. <laughs> well, see, no, that's the one thing from an author's point of view. You want your books to reach out and touch somebody. When your book reaches out and touches you as yes. the author, that is that's yes. amazing. It's, what a it, moment. It, it's extraordinary. And, and I have been involved with um, healing modalities, energy healing modalities over the years. I was trained in Australia in one very powerful modality, and I, I did do that work for a while. Um, but never had this kind of experience. Was, uh, I'm just still shaking my head like, wow, <laughs> that happened. <laughs> so I yeah. hope I pass that on to readers in, in some way. That's amazing. Okay, so that that's I've never heard anyone mention that on a podcast before. <laughs> so that is such a beautiful a beautiful visual as well to to have that happen. That's that's beautiful. Tell me, um so you you started writing, how old were you when you started writing? Oh, I think I I probably started writing at about six or seven. I started wow. reading at four. Um, I, I, we lived way out in the country, very isolated on a farm down the creek from my grandparents' ranch. You know, it was a, a wonderful place to live, but there were no libraries, and I wasn't in school until I was six. And we were of very modest means and didn't have books in the house. We had uh, stacks of old National Geographics where I traveled the world through the pictures. But every Sunday, we would get uh, the Sunday newspaper. My, my dad would drive into the little general store place, uh, you know, a, a few miles from our house, and bring home usually the Yakima Morning Herald. Hmm. And in those days, which, you know, this was a very long time ago, 70 years or almost 70 years, um, there were still the wonderful colored comics, brightly colored comics, you know, open the double page and all the cartoons were there. Well, we didn't have a TV, so of course I didn't see them on television. And so as a very, very tiny girl, I would lie on the floor of my stomach with the comics spread out in front of me. And I literally learned to read that way because every picture was illustrated with words. You know? 
thought bubbles, a Prince Valiant description down at the bottom. Prince Valiant, that was a wonderful source of education for me. <laughs> so by the time I started first grade, I was already reading, and I always have wanted to be a writer and an artist, although I didn't want to admit that publicly for very, very, very many years. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that early lessons of equating pictures and words, do you bring that into your writing style then? Do you equate the photo, the image with, with the words? I, my writing is, uh, some people have said it's cinematic in the sense that it it is a visual, um, it has a tendency to be very visual, although it's in words. Um, and when I write, first I see the story, the story happens in my mind as a movie, and then I have to put words to it, and, and it's often a challenge to do that. Uh, and of course, the movie changes as it goes along, too. But I do always, I, I like to illustrate the covers of my own books and put a few drawings inside, and my wow. one of my great next ambitions is to uh, do a graphic novel. So, yeah. You, you do your own <laughs> illustrations. I didn't realize that based on our conversation. That is beautiful. Now I have another whole appreciation for how beautiful these books are. Thank you. Wow. Amazing. Uh, and, and that's uh, one reason I really love independent publishing, uh, mm. collaborative publishing, because I don't have a, a New York major publisher saying, well, that isn't what sells. This kind of cover illustration sells this year. You know, and you have to wait three years and on and on. So I love having control of every step, every step of the way. Mm, Okay. So that's a good point for our authors that are listening. Um, Is there anything else that you do when you're doing your books that you really like to have control over as far as the whole process? Is there anything else? Well, I... I do have control of what I'm doing, but collaboration is very important to me. Um, The the people uh, at Luminary Publishing in Eugene, Oregon, who put my books together are very collaborative. They're experts, but they they work with the author. Um, But the other thing is, of course, I have a writer's group. of of, There are five of us, and, and we've been together for, I think, this particular group, five or six years now, and it's wonderful very supportive and we are very critical of I mean in a positive way of one another's work as we produce it so um, that's extremely important to me and, and again I, I, the reader is the most important collaborator in this process I, I uh, find that if there's no reader I mean it, this is no surprise if there's no reader the words just lie there like little black squiggles on the screen or or on paper or blank airspace if you're talking about an audio book you know right so it's it's a it's a complete circle it's everybody everybody working together to create this movie in the mind Mm -hmm. okay the writers group i'm curious tell me tell me what does it look like when when you get together as a group are you are you writing at the same time in, in the room or are you um, kind of helping each other with your your work. Tell me, take me behind the scenes. Give us a peek. <laughs> the the more years we know each other, the more we have to force ourselves to stop chit chatting and catching up with one <laughs> another at the beginning of every meeting. But we try to meet every couple of weeks, and uh, we'll meet at one another's homes. And the five of us will sit in a circle around a table with some good nibblies of some kind mm-hmm. on it. Uh, and we each bring or have submitted by then four pages of whatever we're working on that we would like help with. And then while we're in the group, each of us takes a turn also reading our work aloud, even though people have it on, they've already seen it. It's a great, a great help for the author to, to read the words and hear them, hear them even when you're speaking them yourself. And, um, also to sense how the listener's attention is perking up or fading out or, you know, how they, if they're laughing at a particular thing that you want to have be funny, you know. So the, the in-person aspect, reading aloud to one another is very important. And then we give, we take turns giving very serious um, editorial and story-making feedback to one another. And we don't hesitate to say, that part did not work, or 
that's not something that I connected with or whatever. So we have very qualified people in the group who have a background in English and editing and very creative people. So it works well. I love my group. And then I have another small group on on Zoom. And then I'm also with uh, been doing a course with Pages and Platforms, a group out of Portland, Oregon, that is I'm not doing an ad for pages and platforms, mm. there, but if there are any authors out there who want a lot of support, a lot of uh, education, a lot of help uh, marketing and writing the books, check out pages and platforms. Excellent. We'll put a, show, a link in the show notes for that. And, and the one thing I would like to say, Christina, please promote. I want authors to get, find resources, <laughs> tools, suggestions. They're coming here with a blank piece of paper and they're like, teach me. I'm part of the writer's group today. This is the little writer's group we're doing right now. And yeah. if you come across resources that can help somebody, please, please promote. I would love to do that. So, Yeah, well, the two I, pages and platforms. Uh, and also, if you're publishing independently, Luminary Press in, uh, in Eugene, Oregon. It's both internationally known and really superb, supportive. Uh, you know, I think that's one of the major things that, People involved in creative professions or any other profession can get very competitive. Like, oh no, they got their book into such, they got their story into such and such a journal and I didn't. And oh no, I've got, oh. But somebody told me once, there's never, you, you're never going to run out of the need for a story. The right. story may come out, you know, maybe they're movies, maybe they're TV shows, maybe they're books, whatever. But human beings are story making creatures more than anything else. Um, and, and so the more stories, the better. And if your writing buddy in your writer's group wins a Pulitzer, hey, fabulous, you know, right. it raises everybody's boats. That's the quote, right? The rising tide lifts <laughs> all boats. So I love the fact that you're working together in a group and, and you have some security in the sense that you can. You can ask questions and get, get input and everyone works together. That's the idea for the podcast as well. Just so you know, is I want yeah. to have people come on and encourage new authors that are listening who maybe are writing by themselves and they don't have a community, how we can get involved and find those community members. And um, how did you find or were you part of starting this, this group of writers in your community? It's... My my uh, belief is if you want a writers group, you start a writers group. And I I I had um, I had another small writers group for many years. Absolutely wonderful group. Uh, and I wanted I wanted a group of people who also who were interested in publishing. And so I, I sort of segued from the smaller group. I went to a local. Um, larger program for writers and I just happened to meet a couple of the right people that we clicked and you know I mean put yourself out there is what I would say reach out go out put it put it put something on local postings whatever they are saying what you want to do rather than just going oh I wish I had a writer's group because I've been there too and that doesn't work to sit yeah. around yeah. awesome okay um, so Christine, how many books do you have total in your library of, of things you've written? Well, I was I was also going to say, you know, you like to encourage new writers, and bless you, I, you know, I'm almost 73, and I still consider myself a fairly new writer because although I've been writing all my life, it's it's I've I've the only things I've really made money on were ghostwriting for other people or corporations. And, you know, that's an entirely different yeah. thing, writing your own fiction. Uh, and, and I, I now have some leisure, it's not leisure time, but I have some time that I can choose to use differently now. And, uh, all these years I've been experimenting. I can't tell you how many novels I have in the drawer, you know, like, oh, mm -hmm. No, not that one. Yeah. But the ones that I'm most proud of um, are the ones on my website right now. The Tango novel was really me stepping into, well, now I'm going to write fiction. And then I'm really not sure how I started writing young adult fiction. I just, it was the, the protagonist, uh, Stevie, just stepped into my 
mental movie and said, excuse me, I have a story. Hmm. So that's what that is. Um, so really, as far as uh, recent books that I haven't just stuck in the drawer, I would say there are just these three with a fourth one in progress right now, the, the third in the Stevie series. And, uh, and, and since we're in the, you know, encouraging <laughs> phase, um, entering competitions is really good and encouraging. And I, um, this year entered the, um, Chanticleer International Book Awards competition. And my young adult book called Mirages actually has made it up to the finalist level, which I'll find that that's like five levels from the beginning. And so, um, I'll find out in late April whether I won, but I do feel like I won already because the encouragement of being someone saying, Hey, yeah, this is a good book. You know, that's a wonderful thing. It's really very helpful. Mm. A great, um, a great affirmation for you as an author to hear someone else's praise of your book. And, um, tell me about like when you post your books out for sale online and people purchase your book and you hear feedback and reviews. What does that mean for you as an author to read someone's review about your book? Well, my absolutely favorite review was from a 94 year old woman who just thought it was so much fun and she couldn't stop turning the pages. And, and how did I ever come up with all these characters? I absolutely loved it. I thought that is the person, one of the people that I'm definitely writing for is this woman who's still young inside and, and excited about things. Um, and, and I, I uh, am, that first novel now ever is being made into an audiobook right now. And the um, narrator, the person who's reading it is a 14 year old aspiring, well, not aspiring. She is an actress, a 14 year old actress. Uh, I met through her being involved in our tango group. So it's another wonderful circular thing. Um, and, and she's a ideal reader from, you know, she is someone. Yeah. I'm just thrilled to have reading. And honestly, when, when we practice for the audio book and I hear her reading, I go like, oh, she's embodying my character. You know, there she nice. is right in front of me. I, um, I have not been a real strong promoter and marketer. You ask my marketing coach in pages and platforms, she'd kind of laugh at me because, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Um, so I haven't. I haven't uh, been asking people to review or anything like that. So I'm, that is part of my discipline that I'm supposed to be working on now. So anybody out there who reads my books, please, you know, put, I put a review on Amazon or send it to me or whatever. I would love to hear it. And as far as I, I mention Amazon, because of course my book, like pretty much everybody else's book is on Amazon and I accept that. Uh, but I am a real fan of independent bookstores. Um, yes. Like yes. Monroe's book in, in Monroe, Monroe's books in Victoria, BC is a wonderful mm -hmm. one. Um, Powell's City of Books in Portland is absolutely, you know, it's been dear to me since I was a teenager, Portland, Oregon. And they have, of course, they have online sales as well. So you don't have to actually go there. They sell new and used books, which is a wonderful thing. It makes a lot of book, makes many books accessible to people who don't have a lot of money to spend on books. Um, and then we have a wonderful little, um, well, we have two independent bookstores here in Bend that are excellent. And I have been privileged to read at, um, have do readings at Roundabout Books here in Bend that is a woman owned group, a woman owned uh, enterprise that it's just been built from the ground up in the last five years, and I'm so proud and excited of what the owner has done. It's uh, fabulous. So the more you can patronize independent bookstores, the little right. bookstore on the corner, the big bookstore that but still owned without, you know, not controlled by anybody other than the bookstore owners or traditional right. owners of the bookstore, you know, the better uh, our our in the, the information we take in is online or, or um, for example, on, uh, well, I don't want to name any particular sources, but where we get movies online yeah, and things like yeah. 
things can just drop away and suddenly they're gone and you'll never see them again. Uh, and, and, uh, some wonderful, like, um, some versions of things that one really loves can just disappear. And, right. um, but, but if you go to a bookstore and the book is there, you know, you have it. it nobody's going to sort of, you won't open it tomorrow and find half of it is missing or it isn't available. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you spoken, have your like, spoken like somebody who's adored books since practically infancy. <laughs> right. I love this. Um, so we talk about uh, the fact that we, when we chatted earlier, you mentioned something along the lines of readers bring the author's words to life. Now, yeah. that you talked about for your audiobook, which is amazing. But in, 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 your, in your writing, can you kind of expand on how readers bring authors' words to life? Well, as, as I said, if, if nobody reads them, they're just neutral. They're just right. sitting there. Nothing is happening. There's no exchange of, of my ideas with someone else. And, and, uh, and when whichever reader reads a book, if I could see what they're seeing in the book, I might go like, oh, that's not the way I saw it at all. Right. Unless the way the other person sitting over there sees it. But that's part of the creativity of reading, is you're creating this from the words. The author is putting the words there, and then the reader is creating images in their own experience, from their own experience in interpreting those. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I, I meant to mention also my, um, I, I have a, a literary translator who's doing, uh, turning my now ever novel into a Spanish. She's uh, translating it into Spanish nice. for Spanish speaking readers. And I hope to do that and the audiobooks with all of them. Beautiful. That, that's going to open the door for more people. I love that. Yeah. So I'm up here in Canada and Canada has two official languages, English and French. So that would be the next one maybe is to have it in, in French as well. That would open even more doors, right? So it's amazing what you can do with your story and how we can continue to grow and yeah. find new audiences, right? Yeah. And that's what makes it worthwhile to me. If I thought I was just talking to myself, it would be so self-indulgent. You know, it's pleasant. Drink a coffee and write down words. It's really pleasant. It's delightful. Mm -hmm. But if it just ends there, that to me that it doesn't hold the meaning that it has if, if it is uh, passed along. It's nice. Um, we can touch on this a little bit. It's just your ghostwriting background, and I know that in ghostwriting there are certain things we can't talk about. Um, but what gives you joy as a ghostwriter in that process? How does that kind of resonate with you as an author? Well, one of the the books I was a ghostwriter for. Uh, was about the um, restoration of an old sailing ship in Australia. And it was being restored by people who still knew some of the old skills or had to, were, were teaching other people the old skills with this 19th century ship that they built with. And I got to go around to all the workshops. And then the person who was my boss, I guess you'd say in this case, um, was a 80 year old or so, um, sailor. Uh, he, he lived for sailing. His hands, he, he pulled the rope so much. His hands were like just callous, you know, they were just <laughs> sailor's hands. And he was so enthusiastic. And we went to all these shops and saw the people, talked to the people who were doing the work, you know, building different parts for the ship. And it was just an absolutely delightful experience. And then I would record some of what they said and then translate it into, you know, reasonable connections on paper. And when I was done, they, they, my, my, the, the old sailor said, how did you get this story out of those visits? He said, I, I don't know. How, I didn't, I don't know how you put that all together. And, you know, mm. it warmed my heart. It really did. Um, other, Ghostwriting jobs I have had have been more corporate, uh, corporate histories, and yeah. sometimes I could slip in some surprising things that the corporate people didn't necessarily ask me to do. But <laughs> <laughs> that's more it's more craft than an art or a calling in that case. But 
serving a purpose. So, yeah, and helping others who maybe cannot write or need help writing. I had one oh, ghostwriter on my show, and he worked with a gentleman who was very successful in business, but he basically wrote at probably a grade eight, grade nine level as uh-huh. far as comprehension. Yeah. He could tell a great story, but he just couldn't write it down. So he and brought I, my he brought my friend on as a ghostwriter, and was he was able to share in his own words on behalf of the the person he was writing for and capture the stories that yeah. he couldn't he couldn't translate. So I love that. That's I love that you do that. Yeah. yeah, that's that's really a wonderful thing to be able to offer. I mean, I can't um, program my own computer, but maybe the person who programs the computer can't put together a story. hundred percent true. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things that in my, my series about Stevie, the, the teen girl, uh, one of the things that is a very strong focus for me in these stories is that each person has their own gifts. We've heard that. Some of them are really scary. Like in this story, um, she can feel pain with her touch. She can't feel diseases, but she can take away the pain. And a lot of the story from when she's 16 to when she's 18 involves, so what do you do with that? Do you lock it up and pretend, oh, no, I'm going to forget about that because that's too scary. I can't do that. And I think a lot of us, when we're growing up, we have ideas and talents and hopes that we are either told are no good or we're afraid to let anybody know about because it makes us different. And so a lot of my story is about the challenges that Stevie faces in um, accepting and learning to use her gifts and who she can trust to uh, help her rather than try to take advantage of her regarding these gifts. Um, And... So I think that's a very important part of things for me. Also, I, I call it, um, you know, did I already say, <laughs> near future, non-dystopian realism with fantasy elements. I always have to write that down because my, my story is supposed to have a genre, and that's that's the genre that has been identified. Um, I write in the near future because I don't, I'm not writing science fiction. I'm just writing, well, five or six years from now, this could be the situation. Yeah. Um, yeah, it could be. Nobody can say it can't be. And when people are reading that book five or six years from now, they'll they'll know that I wrote it now and didn't know what things were going to be like. So, you know, I'm off the hook as far as getting it exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> Good, yes. Um, but also, I don't write dystopian fiction because I think we, we have enough dystopian situations around us right now. I, I don't want... I used to love reading that stuff, but I don't anymore. I'll just read the news instead, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, So I try, I I don't try to, I mean, I do kind of acknowledge some current situations like climate questions um, in my, in my fiction, but I don't, they they aren't in the forefront. And I don't try to create situations where the world is coming to an end or something. We we can do that for ourselves. I'm I'm doing a fantasy here. (laughs) Right. Um, and and it is non-dystopian realism. I have to say that my reality may be a little more flexible than some people's, and for better or for worse, um, we do tend to get locked into this vision of reality that's created by um, what we are given. You know, we're, what we're given in school, what we're given in advertising. You know what we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to buy, and and I think sometimes I, I know I personally get so overwhelmed with all of that that sometimes I miss oh, but it could be this or it could be that or what's that over there? You know the, the little elements of difference that are so valuable. And so, I mean, if human beings always just stuck to a straight line of being doing what they were told to do. None of us would ever do anything creative. So. Right. Awesome. Christina, so for anyone that's um, a new author, maybe they are, um, I'm imagining them on the ground looking at the newspaper and going through the cartoons <laughs> like you did and 
whatever that translates into today's world, but they're they're looking at it, they're they're admiring the process of writing and dreaming of being a writer. How do you take those dreams and make it reality? Where do we start as a new author? What would you say to somebody listening who's maybe a young well, person? The, the, the good advice, and I, I, I know um, you've heard this before too from others, is read, 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 read. Read everything that interests you even a little bit. And as you do that, you'll begin to sort of catch a wave of what, what you love in a book, what kinds of books you don't love, and what kind of stories are really meaningful to you. And then those are the kinds that you want to develop uh, your ability to write. It, not that you should copy them, but know what you love, know what you love, and that's what you want to go for. And then the other thing is write, 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 write. <laughs> you know, you read, read everything, and then you start writing. And best of all, have other people who are capable, like a writer's group, other people who are wanting to do the same things. If there's some author that you really love, uh, locally or anywhere in the world, don't hesitate to contact them. Don't hesitate to ask, what do you think? What's your advice? You know, there are people out there who would be happy to help and happy to, to um, give information or ideas. And just do it. Just do it. Don't, I, I have to say, once when I was, this is a cautionary tale, a very short one. When I was an undergraduate in college, up in Bellingham near the Canadian border. Um, I had a, a humanities instructor, a humanities professor, and he assigned some kind of research paper for us. I don't remember what it was, something about utopias or something, I think. And I researched it and I wrote and I poured my heart out on it and turned it in and I thought, oh, I hope he likes it. Well, he called me into his office the next day and he said, you plagiarized this. And I said, no. I, I, look, I cited all my notes. I quoted all my quotes. I, I wrote this. He said, no, don't lie to me. You plagiarized this. You did not write this. The point being, I had done a good job. Wow. And, and trust me. And honestly, this is what I would warn aspiring authors against. Don't do what I did. I... I was so shocked, so appalled. I gave up any idea of writing for about 20 years after that. I mean, I wrote, wrote a few poems and things in journals, but I, I thought, well, what's the point, you know? Not everybody is as sort of gullible and, as I was, you know, not everybody would fall for that. Either. So, and if it happened to me now, I would just say, well, I think I'm dropping your class, <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. But um, don't 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 get discouraged, no matter what. That's what I would say to aspiring writers. Amazing. Okay. <laughs> so, Christina, there's all the all the one other group of people that are here with us, and those mm -hmm. are the ones who have purchased your book. They love what you do, um, and they've been following you on your journey as an author. What would you like to say to them while while we're here together? Oh, I, if you've read my book, if you have bought it. Or if you've read it for free from the library as an ebook or whatever, I love you. I'm writing for you, each one of you personally. And and um, if it touches you, that means everything to me. That's and go out and get the sequel. <laughs> Keep coming back. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It seems so nice to have you on the podcast. You are a, a kind and gentle soul and... Um, it comes through in how you speak and how you write and who you are and you're here to help people and you've raised all of our ships just by being <laughs> with us today. So really thank you for being part of the podcast. You did an amazing job. Um, I hope more podcasts are in your future to help promote these great books of yours because more people need to know. And we will have all the links to your website and everything, encouraging everyone to go get the free gift from your website. We'll have all the links in the show notes for that. And I just want to thank you so much for taking time out of your writing day to uh, <laughs> sit and talk with us and, and share some words. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dave. It's been a pleasure. Awesome.
Thank you for being part of living the next chapter. Hey, look at we're we're having such a great time talking to authors around the world. If you are an author and you would like to be on this very show, I would love to talk to you. Livingthenextchapter.com, livingthenextchapter.com, living the next chapter dot com is the best way to get in touch with us. There you'll find our social media and blah 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 la di da and such. You author, soon to be author, new author, currently writing your book author, published author, we need you here. The seat's empty, microphone set up, we're waiting for you. Living the next chapter dot com. We would love to have you on the podcast. Yeah, I am talking. I'm talking to you. Yeah, you should be here. See you at livingthenextchapter.com.